All right, everybody. This is Ross, the Fig Boss. Today we have a very special guest. It is uh, Eric Durchy from the R Figs Forum, and Eric has been probably uh, the biggest champion in my mind um, of R Figs, and he's been one of the main people that I think a lot of people go to R Figs to look at his posts, to look at his information, and he's been doing a great job. You know, being somebody that is a, a responsible and peacekeeper individual to keep you know, figs light and fun. And at the same time, being just a very informative individual, he uh, is is in California in Southern California. Eric, what, where are you actually in, um, in Southern California? Santa Barbara. Okay. So Eric also has not only, you know, really the perfect fig climate, but he also has the fig wasp. And so this year, I think Eric, you didn't have the blastophaga, which is the, the uh, species of the fig wasp. But in the past, Eric has, been very vocal and has been um, really my main inspiration about pollination of fig trees and hand pollinating actually my own figs here in the Philadelphia area. And so we're going to get into a lot of that. We're going to talk about pollination. We're also going to talk about Eric's posts a little bit on our figs because he has a, a really nice palette with a background in chocolate. And so we can talk a little bit about his chocolate business um, and a little bit about how Eric got into figs. And we'll also probably touch on what it's like to grow figs in the perfect place. Um, so without further ado, uh, Eric, if you don't mind, uh, you know, maybe give yourself a little bit of an intro. I know I just gave you a pretty glowing intro, but tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, the things you're doing, your passions, um, and then we can transition into figs. Sounds good. Yeah, so I... I'm a very passionate individual. Whenever I find something that I like, I just dive all in. And currently it's it's figs. So that's one of the things I'm extremely passionate about. Started off as just a little hobby. I thought I'd get a few because my mom talked about them. She had them growing up. And then when we moved out to California, I'm like, hey, I'll grab a couple of fig trees. And then I met some people on the forum. I got to try some samples. And yeah, something happened. It was bad. You guys all know I've got a ton, a ton of trees. So I just, I love mm -hmm. it. I've done all sorts of stuff. I'm a chiropractor by profession, uh, but I've been into gardening since I was a kid, uh, especially fruits and berries um, more than anything else, like watermelons. But I found in Tennessee, I found what I recognized as a black raspberry bush growing on our hill and i told my family and they're like no way we only have blackberries and i'm like no this is a black raspberry bush and i recognized it because of the frost on the canes uh, which was very different so i dug it up and planted it and sure enough it was black raspberries and so you know that was when i was eight years old right and i've i've trialed hundreds of varieties of berries from all over the world i did the same for watermelons every watermelon i could find i tried um corn i've tried every variety of corn that i could and i do all this so that i can see which ones are my favorites i enjoy the the, the journey of getting there right it's fun but also if i'm going to put my time and effort into doing something i want to make sure that i'm i feel confident that whatever i'm growing is the best that's out there i i i just love sharing these things with my friends uh, whenever it's berries, I'll have people come over who say, oh, I don't like raspberries or I don't like blackberries. And I'm like, well, just just hold on. Why don't you try these? You know, and it's just it blows your mind how good some of these varieties can be. Same thing with chocolate. I, I started down this journey around 15 years ago and I pioneered many of the the new ways of processing and thinking about chocolate. I work direct with cacao farmers all over the world. We process them in unique ways to try and bring out subtle, nuanced flavors that other varieties may not have. For example, I had this one bean from Peru, and at the time, there were five bean to bar chocolate makers in the U.S. that were using this same bean, and three of them met at the Northwest Chocolate Festival, and three of them tried my version and came to me and said, why is yours so good? Like, what are you doing that makes it different from what I'm doing, right? And it's just because I, I don't want to do anything different. I've never have a problem with, all right, here's the way it's supposed to be done. Sure, you guys do what you want. But in my mind, I, 
I find a lot of joy and excitement about trying to find a new way of doing it. I never take for granted that, okay, it's been done 3,000 years. It's probably the best way to do it, but what if there's another way? So that's how I approach just about everything in my life is trying to find a way to improve upon what's already existing. That's, that's amazing because I feel the same way about figs, at least so far in my life. I've, I feel like I've made every mistake you can make <laughs> or at least gone against the conventional wisdom, gone against what everybody believes. And in the process of, of making these, these changes and mistakes, you learn why it is that it is actually something that you shouldn't do. Or maybe actually the conventional wisdom is incorrect. And, and so you become so much better. Uh, at whatever it is that you're doing because yeah. of that. Um, I also think it's amazing. It's really one of my favorite things is not necessarily finding the best. I do like finding the best fig variety or the best this, but um, I really like sharing something new uh, with people. So, you know, one of the fruits that I've been really proud of, of promoting is something called the Gumi. And so Gumi is a really interesting fruit that I'm not sure really you'll have, I'm not sure how much success you'll have in Southern California, but you can definitely grow it in, um, in Tennessee. And I would highly recommend it for most people in the country. Uh, it is a, a bush that's related to the autumn olive. And, you know, not every variety of Gumi is really uh, spectacular. Uh, there's one in particular called Carmine or uh, Tillamook, and there's, uh, I think, even another name for it. And it's basically four times the size of other Gumis that are available. And so, obviously, the size is bigger, but the flavor in it is really complex. It's got a level of astringency that typically tends to go away as it ripens, although I personally like a tinge of astringency in my food. Uh, it's got a nice fruit punch or berry flavor, and uh, it's a little tart. It's a little sour. Uh, it's sweet. It's got a lot of complexion, a lot of things coming together in one fruit that I don't find normally in just your typical blueberry or your typical raspberry. Um, so I've been really trying to make people aware of this, and so I, I really get that sense of, uh, you know, hey, come on over and try this thing. Uh, or, hey, viewers, you know, that watch my channel, grow this thing. You ought to grow this thing. There, you know, and, it, and it, that's what I get the most joy out of. And people have, believe, you know, I'm sure you know this, Eric, that people have their super special fig variety, right? They're like, I got this fig, Ross, and it's in my family, and or maybe I, did, I found it here or whatever it is, and it, they don't want to share it with anybody. They're like, hey, I'll give you this fig, Ross, but you can't sell it, and you can't trade it with anybody because I only want so many people to have it or very select people to have it. And I'm just like, that's the most selfish thing I could ever think of because wouldn't you want – if it was really as amazing as you thought, wouldn't you want to share it with everybody else so that they can enjoy it just as much as you? And so, I don't know. To me, that's like the best part about growing anything. Um, you know, I have so, yeah. uh, I make chocolate chip cookies. I've been making them since I was a kid. And my recipe, I, I make my own vanilla. I use a special sea salt. I have to use a certain type of butter. And all these things make a huge difference. I give this recipe to some people. And they always come back and say, why isn't it, why aren't mine as good as yours? I'm like, well, first of all, you didn't use my butter. You just used the amount of butter. You didn't use my vanilla. You didn't use my salt. You're not using my chocolate. So you can share these things, but if they're truly passionate about, about it the way that I am, well, they can make the same thing. You know, I, I definitely feel like sharing these things with others. That's, that's what's so exciting. I have shared so many hundreds of trees to my friends around here who I, I just, I have so many figs. I'm like, come on over and let's taste them. So during the summer, it's like every day I'm giving away plates and plates of them, just putting them out on my porch whenever I have too many, come and pick some up. And it's so fun for me to have these people who didn't even really know what a fig was. And now they're like asking for trees and wanting to grow them. Yeah, there was a guy today who messaged me in, uh, or it was yesterday on Instagram, and he was telling me, uh, he's like, hey, Ross, I got into this thing year, three years ago, and it was all because of you, and he was showing me some photos of his fruits that he ripened, and he's somewhere, I think, in Idaho or Iowa, one of those I states, and so he was like... Uh, Show me the pictures of fruits. I'm like, that's some really nice fruit quality. I'm like, my God, this guy's eating some really nice figs. 
And then he's, uh, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I'm so happy to have inspired you. And then he's like, yeah, Ross, but guess what? I also inspired other people to do the same thing that you inspired me to do. And I'm just like, whoa, this is, yeah, this is a little too much. Um, <laughs> so, Eric, I got a question for you before we move on a little bit about, about figs. But you, I didn't know you were so into coffee, or um, chocolate, excuse me. And so I knew you had a, co- a chocolate coffee oh my god i know you had a chocolate uh business but i didn't understand that you were a pioneer in in all of this and that's amazing um my one question though this is ridiculous but if you were trying to get high quality chocolate um and you can only buy it from the store what brand would you buy (laughs) that is very difficult because there are not many that are in the regular stores that would be of interest to me. Um, okay. So then <laughs> if you, if there was something you could get online, maybe if so, so like for me, I didn't speaking of coffee, cause I didn't really drink coffee my whole life. I didn't really understand it. I don't think I, I, my parents just don't know what good coffee is. And so when I drank coffee as a kid or growing up, I just, was like, ah, I don't understand this. And so I, eventually I finally just kept trying it and kept finding out what was good. And eventually I had some really good coffee and brewed the right way with the right ratio and the right beans. And now I love coffee. Mm-hmm. And so there's got to be a chocolate thing, although I love chocolate. But what is the chocolate maybe that I could eat that I can just get somehow? So my favorite um, American chocolate company is called Amano Chocolate, A-M-A-N-O. I'm really good friends with the owner. We started our businesses around the same time. Uh, He, along with me, we were pioneers in the U.S. in working direct with farmers and sourcing direct versus buying from the the large distributors around. And 15 years ago, there were not the cacao brokers that there are now. It was very difficult to find high-quality cacao beans. So working direct with the farmers was critical. And Amano Chocolate was definitely one of the pioneers. The owner, his name is Art Pollard. He's a, um, he's a great guy. He's, he's very passionate about what he's doing. He's a computer science programming guru. And he started chocolate because somebody told him he couldn't make good chocolate. So he was just like, all right, well, let's see what I can do. <laughs> and from there, his passion turned into chocolate for quite a while. So Amano chocolate is definitely what I would recommend here in the U.S. Okay, so I'm going to try to get that and see if my perspective on co- on uh, chocolate, I said coffee <laughs> again. I just have coffee on the brain, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, it's kind of confusing. And I'll see if my our, chocolate perspective. My main company is called Creo Brew, and it's cacao that's roasted and ground, and you brew it like coffee. So now you're going to be even more confused. Oh. That's my main product. Is, wow. Is cacao brewed like coffee. <laughs> so... Eric, let me ask you this, because this is where I want to kind of transition into is, is about, you know, your palate. And I, I personally think, I don't know what it is exactly, maybe because I can't see, obviously there's genetic things, but, you know, uh, I would consider myself to have a above average palate compared to most people. And I don't know if I always had that as a kid. Like, I don't think I maybe, uh, was born with it. Um, I don't think obviously I'm on the level of a sommelier or, or, or some chef like uh, Massimo Batora or someone like that, but I certainly know what's good and I know what's not. And so is this a thing that you, you think you were born with? Do you think it's a thing that you've cultivated? Obviously, you've definitely cultivated it, but do you think there is a level of you're born with it and how much of that cultivation have you you know, sort of made over the years? I would say the majority of it is cultivated talent. We used to have these blind taste tests where we would sit around and we would try 15 new bars and we would share our thoughts independently on what we were tasting. And then the next person would share and like, oh, wait, they noticed a little bit of cinnamon in that one. And this person noticed a little bit of pine. And over time, we got to where all of us had improved and some of us a lot more than others. Um, I I do think that maybe I had a natural talent for it, but it was definitely cultivated. It would have been one of those talents that I had no idea that I had, if not for my effort to try and 
and improve my palate so that I could make better chocolate. Uh, but I think anyone can learn how to do this. That's one of the reasons why with good quality artisan chocolate, there are usually flavor notes on the back. You may not taste those if you're new to chocolate unless you know they're there. So if you take a bite, see what it tastes like, and then read the back and then try it again and say, hey, can I actually taste a subtle hint of strawberry in there? And sometimes you, you'll notice that you can. That was actually my goal. Interesting. I had a, an artisan chocolate line for a while. Um, shortly after we moved to California, our house burned down and this was a, a family business, the chocolate one was, and we lost everything. We lost all of, all of our equipment for that chocolate line. It was lost. Um, but my goal with that chocolate line was not to make the best chocolate in the world, but it was to make some of the most expressive chocolate in the world. So if I told you that there were going to be hints of, of lemon or tangerine in there, you were going to be able to taste it. So I processed everything from the plantation all the way to the finishing, tempering the chocolate. I processed it in a way that tried to enhance maybe two or three flavor notes instead of the 30 that were in there. So that was my goal. And I feel like it was done um, fairly successfully. In fact, I was on a, a trip in Nicaragua with my wife. And this was, this was one that it was safe for her to go to. A lot of the areas I visit, I wouldn't want my family to come along with. But this was more of a guided cacao plantation tour. And there was a, a lady on the tour with us, she was from England and she didn't like me, which for me was weird because most <laughs> people like me, you know, I'm fairly outgoing, I'm happy, I'm positive. And it's just, there was something that was just weird. So I asked my wife, I'm like, what is going on? Do you feel that? There's like some sort of tension here. <laughs> so finally I went up and I just introduced myself more. I really tried to get her to open up and uh, she asked me about my chocolate and so I told her about my line and what my goal was. And all of a sudden, she just like completely shifted. So apparently, she was one of the judges on the London Academy of Chocolates. <laughs> so, and I had submitted some chocolates. And I won, uh, I won third place with my first bar I ever made in the world, right? But she thought, because some of the flavors were so expressive, she thought that I was adding essential oils and lying about it and not putting that on my packaging until we had a chance to meet. And she understood like that is the only thing I'm trying to do is bring out some of these flavors in a strong way so that even you, your first time trying dark chocolate, terrible palate, completely unrefined. If I say there's lemon in there, you're going to taste lemon. Right. So then things changed entirely as she understood what my goal was. So that's a little bit about my chocolate line, but as far as palettes go, you can you can definitely improve and cultivate a talent for being able to taste fine, subtle flavor notes. That's good to know because my girlfriend was very curious. I think she uh, that was like that was her question, uh, and um, you know it's amazing. I think that story as well. It just really rings true with uh, with me as well in some respects in that. You know, I haven't met too many people I've met actually in real life. I mean, obviously, you have a perspective on somebody and you think you know them based on what you're seeing right now. And they have a persona or they have an, uh, an online presence or whatever it is. And people are just so quick to judge and so quick to um, assume things about uh, other people. And, uh, for me, it's become such an eye opening experience being somewhat of a public figure, uh, that it, it, it's amazing that it's not just affecting me, but it affects so many other things in people's lives and other, other public figures and other famous people. Um, when, if you just actually sit down and get to know the person, you know, there's a probably a slim chance you would ever even get in an argument with them, you know, but you would get in an argument with them over the internet over something so stupid. The anonymity um, of the especially... internet is, is a poison. It's terrible. It's unfortunate, but I don't know how to so, counteract it. <laughs> so let's talk now about growing figs in California. Um, because, you know, you, you have been um, someone, obviously, we just talked about your palate 
And for those people who don't know about our figs or have been on our figs and have seen Eric's post, because there's probably quite a bit of you guys, um, Eric has really beautiful photos of his figs, and he um, ripens them super well. You can tell by looking at them, it's not just his climate. I mean, he lives in the great, a really nice place, but he really knows how to grow figs. It's just obvious that he's doing something that even other people in California may not be doing. Um, and so I wanted to touch on, you know, um, what it is exactly about California and what it is that you're doing that uh, maybe you could help other people or give some people some tips. So let's start off with what is it like growing figs in California or in a hot and dry place? Well, there are some, some definite misconceptions about California. For example, it is not hot and it's not super dry here. In Santa Barbara, oh. it's not. We, okay. we have a very moderate climate. In the middle of the summer, it's routinely 68 to 75 degrees. That is oh my. more often than not what we get. So my season starts much earlier than many of you back east. But you guys all catch up. You start ripening figs around the same time because you get hotter temperatures than we do. So it's also pretty pretty humid here. I would say our average humidity is 40 to 60%. With overnight, on a regular basis, we have 95 plus percent humidity for several, several hours. So mm. I understand a lot about the the fig splitting and things like that because of it. And one of the critical things that I do is I think most people that have come to visit me and they see the, the restricted water that I give my figs, I keep them, them fairly dry. Uh, there's been a lot of debate recently about Colonel Lippman's black cross and it being such a vigorous grower. Well, I keep mine, my in-ground ones and in pots, they are very minimally watered. Unless I notice some like signs of stress, I try not to water them. And then I only water them the bare minimum. So I think that is mm -hmm. one of the huge things for why I'm able to have some, some really high quality fruit. I think most people tend to overwater them. I know you guys can't do anything about your in-ground trees because you get the rain mm -hmm. that you get. We don't. We don't we literally will have eight months where there's no rain at all. So it's far easier for me to control the moisture that they get. But I do think that controlling that moisture, if you're able to find a way to effectively do it, that's critical for the figs that I'm able to ripen. So Eric, I, you know, I, I didn't know exactly where Santa Barbara was. I just looked it up, as you mentioned, that you're not really in a hot and dry place. And so you're right near, you're on the coast yeah. basically, and you're, you're above LA and so when you're on a coastal area of California, it's quite cooler and, you know, a lot like, um, you know, what, what's that city up north uh, with all the homeless people? Oh, my God. Um, that, you know, you, I'm sure a lot of people know what I'm talking about. But basically, you, you live uh, in a place that typically can be quite mild. And the further you go inland, the more hot and dry it gets. And um, so I didn't know that. And that's amazing. It gives It gives me even more confidence in your abilities as a fig grower, which is weird for me to say that. But um, I, I've i been preaching the same thing for years. And so people still fight me on this all the time. I don't know why. Um, uh, they think that they can somehow get away with watering their trees more. And so I always would push back, especially for those people who are trying to get higher quality fruits rather than the, the highest quantity. You know, there's some people who brag about, oh, I got 300 figs on my potted fig tree this year. And I'm like, okay, well, how many did you ripen? And how many of them are really good? Yeah. How many of them actually gave you that mind-blowing experience that figs are supposed to do? Yeah. And so, you know, that's my always been my lesson to everybody on the channel is – don't water your figs. Only give them the bare minimum of what they need to be happy and healthy. And beyond that, all that water is going to be just sent right into the fruits yeah. because the, the fig tree is like a cactus. You know, if you actually stop the water, first off, the water is the on or off switch of growth. And so if you want the tree to grow, you give it water. You want it to stop growing, you stop giving it water. There is a an interesting story. I had a friend of mine 
My grandfather was a barber in Philadelphia for many years. My uncle became a barber in Philadelphia, still is a barber for many years. And so they used to cut this guy's hair as he, as he was a kid. And so he's been seeing my, my grandfather and my uncle for his whole life getting his hair cut. And so that's how I met him. And I learned that he was in the figs and I, uh, it's just this weird story about how he got divorced and kicked out of his house. And I know it's a weird turn, but Eventually, he's like, Ross, you got to go over to my house because I got all my potted fig trees there and I've been kicked out of the house and it's been months. It's been like two months at this point and no one's taking care of them and there's no way that they're they're like maybe even alive at this point. And so this is like middle of the summer. And so I go over there, grab the fig trees. The wife's not home. <laughs> I don't know if I should be admitting this, but he told me to do this. And so I put them in the car, take them back to my house. He's like, yeah, take care of them for me while uh, before I can get them back from you. And so I got the trees, but none of the trees had any leaves on them, amazingly. I mean, of course, but the trees looked fine. In fact, I was like, this is amazing. The branches still look healthy. The the wood is you know green underneath the bark. Yeah. and. And so the, the tree basically went into this uh, cactus mode is what I like to call it. And so it just basically stores so much water in its trunks and its roots, its branches, and just has that ability. So if the tree can do that, I have a hard time believing it's not putting some of that water into the fruits throughout most, if not all, of the ripening process of, uh, of a fig. And so the big debate, and Eric, maybe you can comment on this, is when you water a fig, when the fig first set on the tree and they're very small, and maybe they're in that first stage and they haven't even swelled to that slightly larger stage, um, does the water that you give them in excess at that point matter? Does that affect the flavor? I don't, at what point does it affect the flavor? I don't think it really starts to affect it until they start to swell. In the final stage. Okay. And that's also where it's critical to not overwater. So, you know, there it's it's very important. I, I set up drip irrigation one year because I have so many trees and it was taking me so much time. But I quickly scrapped all of that because two trees that looked exactly the same, one of them drank twice as much water as the other. And I didn't know how I could set all of that up. And it changed from week to week. So... You have to have like an intimate knowledge of what you're growing and be able to know when it needs water and when it doesn't. If you let it dry out too much and then you add a lot of water and some of those figs were about to start swelling, they're going to split like nothing. I don't care if it's a non-splitter. They're going to split if you add too much water when it was too dry at the wrong time. So don't let them dry out too much. If you want to avoid fig splitting, sure, keep them uniformly wet, but you're not going to have the high quality fruit that you can get if you're more restricting it a little bit but it's it's challenging you know each variety and each tree the root system sometimes it just grows a whole lot better than it would on another of the same exact tree and if you're watering them both the same way one of them is not going to be getting the right amount of water but as far as like you're saying whenever they're little the figs are little before they've started to swell. I've never noticed any difference. I water the heck out of them so that they're growing like crazy until they start to ripen and swell their first figs. That's when I start to, to limit the water that I give them. So I would push back on that a little bit in that in years of drought, certainly here in this year, especially, um, you know, the, the figs have been obviously of a higher quality. And so there's a big difference in quality from, I think one year to the next and uh, I could be really trying hard. I even one year I added uh, plastic bags over top of every single pot. It created a mosquito nightmare, uh, oh. but I made sure that I was controlling 100% of the water going into every single container. And so by doing that, I learned quite a bit. And um, I have to say that, uh, especially when you have a drier soil and then it rains and you water a lot, it definitely buffers a little bit uh, and you don't see nearly as much splitting. Um, that was the big takeaway. But also I, I do tend to find that, in especially that year, I had uh, better quality than, than most years, if not really any year. And the only year I can think of 
is really this season, which there was a drought. And so it definitely rained at times when the figs were ripening. Um, but I will, I can almost guarantee you that because the figs had such a dry soil, in fact, it was so dry with some of my in-ground trees, which was just kind of a shocker, that some of them really didn't even produce a lot of fruit. In fact, they would grow uh, and the fruit buds would set. But at a certain point of the year, the fruit buds just didn't continue swelling. And so they stayed a little bit dormant on the branches. And some of them even, they fell yeah. off the branches. Uh, there was little scars, actually, on the, the branches of the fallen fruit buds. And so um, on trees like that, I was absolutely amazed at the difference in quality. Uh, and I have to, I, and I can really only put a finger on it that it was really the entire length of the season that made a big difference because even when I was harvesting figs after a rain or, you know, when the, the soil had really started to rehydrate and the trees resumed growth, the figs were still amazing coming from those in-ground trees because of that drought that we had pretty much for the mo like most of the summer. Um, so, I, yeah, I would push back on it, but... Um, you know, I think regardless, the message is clear that we need to be lowering the amount of water in, uh, in our containers. And so this brings up another point. I'm curious to know what you think. Um, when you have a young tree, and so a lot of people for years, I used to fight people on this all the time. They would say that, well, the tree has to mature. It really has to get a few years, maybe even five years, three to five years before it really starts to produce a high quality fruit. Well, my argument is if you just keep the water to a minimum, because young trees love to suck up that water, and they have a lot of room to grow in these containers. So they'll, they'll absorb water like you wouldn't believe. So if you can just keep a, a younger fig tree a little bit on the drier side, you could still produce a high-quality fruit. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I do think that some trees can produce phenomenal-quality figs, six months after you rooted it. But I do have some others that I had pretty much written off and they were in my coal pile this year. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that is not what I've had the last two years. But I that is definitely the vast minority of figs. Usually if they don't impress me their first year, it's not something that is going to impress me in year two and year three. I've trialed hundreds and hundreds of varieties, and most of them, I've trialed them over a couple of years, and very rarely does one make me change my mind on whether or not it was a keeper. But we'll see. All right, so let's talk now about the humidity here, Eric. And so one of the things that people ask me all the time is they say, Ross, you know, I, I want to grow figs in a humid place like you, or at least I don't want to have to move somewhere dry. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grow figs under a, a high tunnel or a greenhouse. And um, and so that way I can completely not have any rain touch the figs and I can control the soil moisture that way. But I, I want to push back on that because it seems like to me, especially this year with the year that we've had with drought, that, you know, the lower the humidity is in the, in the air, uh, the more the water gets sucked out of the fruits. So it's not just about you know, keeping the right soil moisture. It's also, I think, about having a lower humidity. And so if you have rain, as an example, hit the skin of the fig, well, then the rain actually goes into the skin, uh, depending on the variety. And so the skin then absorbs that moisture. And so rather than having less water in the fruit, uh, you now have more water in the fruit. And so the opposite is also true, it seems like, with humidity, that it's it's really sucking that moisture out of the, the fruit as it ripens. And so um, what do you think about that? Because you are now, you said you're in a Santa Barbara, which is a place that has varying degrees of humidity. So you must have a pretty good perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, there are many, many nights during the summer, during the fall, like now we're in that period where every day I'm going to wake up and it's going to look like it has rained outside because the ocean fog is so heavy and it actually feels like it's sprinkling on you for hours. <laughs> the sun won't come out until 12 o'clock. So from about midnight until 12 o'clock in the afternoon, we have 90 to 95% humidity easily, right? So that makes controlling rust an issue, but I'm not so sure whether the skin of the fig 
absorbs it or if it's the leaves that absorb it and cause them to to swell but i do know that whenever it's dry the the figs from whenever they're really ripe they look big if you let them sit there and condense they they'll shrink sometimes to almost half their size because they're losing a lot of that moisture which is awesome because now you have this condensed fig that most of the pictures that i post are like that they were significantly larger a few days ago and then you wait just long enough and now they've they've shrunk 30 to 40 maybe 50 percent of their size and and the flavor is a lot more concentrated when it's really dry and we have some of those days the skin does get a lot harder even on some varieties that have a thick skin that's somewhat soft sometimes they can be pretty leathery whenever it's really hot and dry Absolutely. I've noticed that this year too. We had a couple days of a hundred degrees and, and it was really dry. And I was like, Oh my goodness, this Smith ripens so quickly and the skin is so different than it normally is. And so I was like, that must be what it's like to grow figs in a really hot and dry place. Um, now let me, let me push, let me just dig a little bit deeper here with the humidity. So are you saying by the way, that you're not sure about the humidity, um, higher level of humidity like you said at night actually adding water to the fruit um or are you talking about the rain i mean through the skin of the fig itself i, I don't know I, I do know that the leaves whenever there's humidity in the air the leaves are going to suck all that up as if it was being watered from the roots which then is going to go into the fig anyway i just i don't know uh I'm not making a statement one way or the other, but I'm not sure that the skin of the fig absorbs that water, but I know the leaves do. Mm -hmm. So if you had high enough humidity that was basically morning dew, yeah, that's almost like having rain. And so in my, my mind, I'm convinced because I've seen just crazy amounts of rain in my years of growing figs. And you can even visibly see wherever the rain kind of collects on the fig, that's where you'll see the cracking. That's where you see the water, the water absorption, and you can visibly see it. It's not a, a big mystery, and that's also where you see splitting. And in fact, the you know the eye of the fig is such a sensitive spot because it ripens from the bottom up, and so that's the spot that is the softest and the most vulnerable. And so, if you have an eye that's pointed upwards rather than hanging down, well, then the rain comes down and hits the eye, and then it it hits that sensitive spot and fast absorbs into the skin and causes a quicker expansion of that fruit. And that's at least what I've noticed is the biggest reason for splitting uh, among many others. But um, so I'd be, I'm very curious because when I observed the, you know, the, tre the trees this year with the drought, and then I observed, you know, some of the <laughs> figs this year with maybe a little bit more of a higher humidity. It was amazing, I think, to see the humidity being sucked out. But also, I'm now curious at what percentage of humidity, if it's true, that water is actually being pushed into the fruit now. And so it's something interesting to think about, as always, because, again, these people who want to grow figs in these high tunnels and they live in these humid places or they have a greenhouse that's not – Humidity controlled, you almost are asking for trouble because. Yeah. Uh, so, Matt, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I have, even though I have really high humidity during the prime ripening season, I don't have a whole lot of splitting, but I also have much lower temperatures than many of you guys. So they're not ripening as quickly. So they're able to develop more sugars and they're swelling a little bit slower. During the, the hotter summer months, I have a fig that may take three days to ripen. And in the fall, like right now, they'll still ripen phenomenally well, but they may take six or seven days. And so I wonder if that humidity plays more of a role on causing figs to split whenever it's also combined with that higher heat. Just wondering. I don't know. I know I, I don't have the high heat, so it's hard for me to say what it would be. So I think you're right um, because when you have a fig that has a it's, – it's ripening quicker, right? So there's higher heat. The hang time is shorter. The susceptibility window is, is shorter. Yeah. And so it's ripening quicker, and therefore the fig is more vulnerable in a shorter period of time. And so if it rains on that fig in that short period of time or if it is a much higher level of humidity, then it only makes sense to me that it would contribute – in a negative way more than if it was colder. Uh, but I've always 
in a way, actually seeing the opposite uh, because what I prefer is to have a very short hang time, a very short susceptibility window on my figs, and that's what's the figs that really avoid the rain. Um, so I don't try to really ripen many of my figs while it's raining or after the rain. I like to pick them before and then have figs that quickly ripen at, like after that rain period so then I can have a higher quality. And so we had Hurricane Ian come in this year, and we had six days straight of rain and, and drizzle. And so there was really only one fig at the time that was ripening to be able to do this, so I don't want to say that it's the only one but little ruby which is a fig that gets no credit whatsoever uh for so many things um it's actually a very figgy variety eric i don't know if you're into that but uh it's got a lot of dried fruit flavor uh, it's just a basic sugar fig but it's the dried fruit flavor is a lot like a, a date or a persimmon and, and something like that so i love it for that reason but also the hang time the susceptibility window is so short so i before the hurricane came in I picked some pretty darn good figs. Then we had really cold and rainy days for six days straight. And I was able to pick a super nice fig. I mean, for that time of the year and for that period of time was amazing. Two days after it stopped raining. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I you know, after a rain, a rain event like that, it's very easy to have figs ruined for weeks. Yeah. Um, so anyway. This is a pretty, it's pretty interesting, I think, the, the level of detail and how intricate you can get with all this. And I'm glad that you're paying attention to all this, even where you're at, because, you know, it's not something, uh, at least for me, it's on my mind at all times when I'm growing figs. You know, I'm not thinking about many other things. It, it, like, as a farmer or as a fig farmer, you're always paying attention to the weather. And for me, I'm always paying attention to that rain. Uh, when's the rain coming in? When do I have to go out there and pick all these figs to get them off the tree before I'm not going to have anything substantial? And so, um, it's yeah, it's 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 really a testament to how well you're observing what you're actually doing. Um, so, let's see here. We talk about you know growing figs in California. Um, we talked a little about your palate, but let's talk about you know the flavors of these things now, and let's talk about caprification. And so I was very lucky that David Burke, um, the fig hunter, and his family was just so generous to send me a thing, a, a, 10 different varieties of wild seedlings that he found, uh, got them all together, shipped them to me overnight, and it was like I picked them off the tree myself. It was amazing. Um, and so I got to taste California wild seedlings that were caprified. And, and to me, that was one of the most – amazing fig eating experiences of my life. I've had some fruits that I've been able to ripen here that I would argue will rival the quality of a, someone in a very hot and dry place, but it doesn't happen that often. And maybe there's a period, maybe of a week, or maybe there's a three week period every year of some variation. Um, but it really rarely happens. And so to get that from him and to experience that and to, to really kind of put me in my place because I thought I was, you know, I thought I was like on this level and then he gave me these caprified figs and I just couldn't believe how good they were. Yeah. And so tell us about the wasp and what it does and all that crap. Yeah. It's been really interesting <laughs> this year. I've had very, very, very limited wasp activity for mostly because I was experimenting with some non approved treatments for the black fig fly, which was just devastating last year. The good news is it seems like I, I was very effective in controlling that population, not completely eliminating, but controlling it. But the bad news is it seems like that also killed off my wasps. And where I am growing mine, I don't have, I, I have my own colony of wasps and I did not want to bring in any capra figs from other trees around because the black fig fly was so bad here i was afraid of bringing them back and reinfesting my trees so this year i was able to really experience almost every one of my figs without caprification which was an eye opener some of my absolute favorite figs that were just mind-blowing knock your socks off 
they were completely unimpressive without caprification. But some other varieties were almost the same. They weren't quite as juicy, they weren't quite as big, and weren't quite as flavorful, but they were still exceptional quality figs. So I did a lot of work this year in trying to figure out which ones are amazing with and without the wasp, and which ones are worth hand pollinating should the wasp pollen colony completely disappear at some point due to the black fig fly, or if I move somewhere where I don't have the fig wasp, um, some of these figs are going to be caprified. A caprified Feather River is the best fig I've ever had in my entire life, hands down, and it has been for three years in a row. It's phenomenal. Wow. The, the uncaprified version I haven't had yet. Sounds mm -hmm. like it's a good one, according to some people, like um, Steve down in Florida. He ripened it, said it tasted like mango, and so, you know, it's common, but it... Uh, I can't imagine that it's going to be anywhere near what it was this year, just based on pictures that I've seen. These things are 100 grams of the most dense, flavorful fig you've ever had. And there's another one like Oriola, Planera. Planera is a fig that when it's caprified, it is exceptionally dense. And it tastes like tropical fruit punch whenever it's been caprified. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Like, you ask uh, Ventura Bananas. So Mark came up, and last year, it was his time. He got to try them caprified because he doesn't get very many. And it was one of them that he was just completely blown away by because of that insanely complex flavor that it had when it was caprified. This year, it's just a, you know, it's a good fig, but it's nothing like the caprified version. So the thing that I learned most is that there are some exceptionally high-quality figs. Uh, Black Madeira, with or without caprification, is an amazing fig. A lot of the Adriatics, with or without caprification, they're spectacular. They're just a little bit bigger, a little bit juicier, a little bit more flavorful with caprification. So really understanding, and that's one of the reasons this year why I have almost exclusively posted pictures of uncaprified figs, because I actually got tired of everyone saying, oh, you can't share your pictures because we can't grow them like that because you have the wasp. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to test every fig. You have no idea how many buckets of water and cups I've thrown away because I'm testing every fig to see if any of the seeds <clears throat> sink so I can know if they were caprified. And I'm trying to make sure that I tell people, like, these are uncaprified figs. So what you're seeing right here, which looks very similar to what I posted in the past, you can get this. Yes, I have an ideal, I think, perfect climate for fig growing. But it's not the wasp right now. So I think it's actually given a lot of people hope, realizing that, you know, this is just take care of your trees, give them the right amount of water, and give them a little bit of time, and we can all have some of these phenomenal quality figs, even without the wasp. So, Eric, I I want to touch on, because David and you, yourself have really driven the point home to me that capification is quite amazing. And so I've read all of the fig documents. I've read all the books. I've read all the what the fig experts say. And so the general consensus is that caprification or pollination of, of fig fruits will increase the size and the quality. And so that's pretty much it. That's, that's where it ends. That's where the conversation ends. That's what the information is. And so I was always of the impression until you guys came along this year, and, well, at least I got those figs from David. And so I was in the impression that, well, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, it's more about the water. It's more about how you grow them. Um, <laughs> it's more about the drier climate. And so here I come to find out, well, in fact, this caprification is is insane. It's it's on a whole nother level with, as you said, specific varieties. And so I wanted to drive the point home to everybody watching. It's not just making them better quality and larger. Like it's more than that. It's really important. And so it's a huge, huge difference. Like I don't know how to say it more than that. Like I just, I so I messaged you after I had this experience with David's figs, and I said, Eric, like, 
you know, am I losing my mind here? Or <laughs> is this just what it is where you guys are when you get them capified? And you said, if I remember correctly, that if I move away from where I'm at, I'm going to get capra figs, I'm going to grow capra figs, and I'm going to have pollen, and I'm going to hand pollinate my own figs to get that experience. And so... Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. I, I have... I was of the mind last year that I wouldn't even waste my time growing figs anymore if I couldn't have them caprified. Now mm. I changed my mind. There are, are plenty that are good enough. But once you've had a taste of a perfectly ripened caprified fig of some of these varieties, nothing else compares. This year, I have had so few, oh my gosh, moments <laughs> compared to my previous years, right? And that's what I'm growing figs for. I'm growing figs yeah. for those mm -hmm. those yep. orgasmic like moments of eating, you know? And that is something that seems like it can only happen when they're caprified. And I'm not alone. Several of my neighbors and some local fig people on the forum who have come and experienced these with me, who have tried caprified and uncaprified, we all all feel the same. Like I if I move Without a doubt, I will be hand pollinating. I'll, I'll be very selective. Um, I won't hand pollinate all of them because some of them are delicious, but I'm definitely will always have pollen available so that I can caprify a, a decent percentage of these figs. So here's my thing that I think you should think about now that you just said that. And so this actually comes back to the humidity. <clears throat> and so when you caprify a fig, is it pretty much across the board? What would you think that across the board that the size of almost all the varieties or all of the varieties does increase or is that not always true? In my experience, now I haven't specifically documented this 100%, but if I was to guess based on what I've seen, every one of them is noticeably larger when caprified. Okay. So Green Beach my... Greenska, they're, they're these tiny little end of my thumb size things whenever they're uncaprified. So, you know, I, I don't know. It's on the camera. You can't tell. I'm a big guy. But, <laughs> um, but the caprified version were twice as big. So some of them, it makes them twice as big. Others, they're, you know, 20 to 30% larger. But I don't know that I've seen any that aren't bigger when they're caprified. So I do want to give you, Eric, and uh, for anybody else in a, a humid climate, a little bit of pushback and a little bit of things to, to think about. And so when we talk about growing figs in humid climates, it's it's really important to talk about the size of our fruits. And so I think you would agree, Eric, that when you have a, a smaller fruit and when the fruit is uh, or the, the air is a bit less humid, it's it's just lower in humidity the water tends to get sucked out of that smaller fruit a bit quicker. And so when it's larger, it takes a lot longer for that, that water to get sucked out. And so when you have larger fruits, just in general with the humidity, but even excluding the humidity, there's going to be more water in a larger fruit. And so when you think about caprification, you think about it increasing the size of the fruits. And my friend Raphael would probably... Who, by the way, I've never admitted this openly, but he was my original fig mentor. And so he would probably reprimand me if um, I didn't mention this because Raphael has been one of the bigger proponents against caprification in, in especially humid places. And so that was his main thinking. And that if you, I, I don't exactly know, I don't want to speak for him, but I believe if you even over pollinate a fig, it can lead to some other problems and, and potential splitting. And so just in general, when I look for a fig variety that does well here or for anybody in a humid place, it's typically going to be smaller. And so Eric, by the way, when you, pu you published a video somewhat recently, I think this year on a lot of the hardy Chicago type mm. figs and you compared them all side by side. And I was very curious to see what you had to say about Azores Dark and compared to some of these other ones because well f crap i want to try to find the best heart of chicago you know every heart of chicago that i try i always end up going back to azores dark so i always use that as the benchmark and i always want to continue on and see if there is any ones that are better 
And so far I have, I haven't come to that conclusion, but maybe I will someday. And so the point though, I think that makes Azor's dark better typically than the others is the point that you made for why the others are better than Azor's dark. And so one of your main points was that they're larger. So you like crows and cond and uh, the other one, uh, red Lebanese baka. Mm -hmm. So you said that they're, larger fruits and so they typically maybe even have a little bit of a more complex flavor for another reason that you mentioned and you didn't like azores dark and the other one because they were slightly smaller typically and that was one of the things that you prefer i mean obviously if i if i could eat larger figs i would i would prefer eating a larger fig but nine times out of ten the smaller fig is going to ripen to a higher quality here than a larger fig and so they just intensify more there's less water I don't have really low humidity, so if I can get as least water in the fruit as possible, that's what I'm going to prefer, and that's a big reason I think why I've realized this year that I really prefer um, Azores Dark over the other ones. So what do you think about caprification in that sense of splitting and increasing the size, and when you go to Tennessee... Yeah, that's got to be something you got to have to. Think oh man, about. I'm going to have to completely relearn how to grow figs. That's for sure. So I, I am now <laughs> paying much more attention to what the people that I know in Tennessee and surrounding areas are growing. What are they saying? What is their experience? Is that going to mean that I'm not going to bring my absolute favorites? No, I certainly will, and I'm going to hope for the best. But I do know that it's going to it's going to turn things on their head. Caprification. So sometimes the wasps just really come in and not all figs are at the right stage. So they'll get over caprified and they just explode. So many will just explode. The flowers, are just they're just like red, like boom, they bust right open. So I would imagine that if you also had humidity added to the mix, those ones that were borderline, super tight and just like so dense, those things very likely will just rupture, just blow right up if you add a little bit too much water. So I anticipate that being a, a serious issue. Now, to your comments about the hardy Chicago types, Mount Etna types, um, you like the smaller ones. They handle the, the humidity and stuff better. But here, again, because we just don't get rain, those figs out here that ripen, I'm able to just leave them on for a few more days, and they shrink like half the size. So they're exceptionally concentrated but they're tiny now those mount etnas i mean the like the standard hardy chicago type the malta black azorius dark those ones they are like the size of a nickel whenever they are concentrated the way that i have some of the large ones like red lebanese and crows so that for me if if i can have a fig of similar quality and one of them is twice as big as the other i'm going to take the bigger one every time but yeah i understand that in your humidity that may not be something that you you just can't afford to take that risk you got to protect them split a split fig a soggy fig is no good it's really interesting i'm i'm glad to hear your perspective on that um it's just amazing i wish i could grow figs in every location there is you know like i wish i could grow them in the desert i wish i could grow them in northern california or the pacific northwest or wherever you know just to get just to learn every single thing i could and it's just so impossible um but the nice thing is though about where i'm at at least is that i live in a or at least my yard is right on the edge of like failure and success you know we either have the trees survive the winter or they die. We either have, you know, a drought or we get hurricanes. We either have, you know, uh, just uh, even with the amount of light that I receive in my yard. Um, I'm right on the border of a variety like Smith or even Colonel Littman's Black Cross from even setting fruits because I just don't get enough sunlight. And so there's been so many lessons with growing figs in just a, just a crappy place that you wouldn't get maybe somewhere else and um, vice versa. I mean, man, I, um, I got to tell you, I, I really do think that I'm in like fig paradise. It's going to be tough to grow figs anywhere else other than here. I took some of my figs up to the, you know, to Doug's place and up there, they didn't like Smith. 
Harvey didn't like Smith. Doug didn't like Smith. Just for whatever reason, in their higher heat and lower humidity, they just didn't like it. But everybody was raving over the ones that I brought up. You know, and I have that same thing happen. I just, I really think that we have a perfect climate and man, it's going to be tough to leave. <laughs> it's almost worth staying just for the figs, man. <laughs> it is, honestly. I mean, people tell me all the time, they're like, Ross, why don't you just move to California? You love figs so much. Why don't you just go somewhere where it's perfect? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, it's just leaving my family, my friends, like, Plus, I feel like there's got to be a way, and I'm really interested to see what you do in Tennessee, because there's going to be a way to figure this out. You know, like I, I don't, ha I don't have the right setup right now, but eventually I will. And so there will be a day where you and I can grow figs in these terrible places and get the quality potentially of what you're getting in Santa Barbara. And so I don't feel like there's going to be such a, a need to move somewhere else, but. Um, yeah, I think it's it is making it a little harder on ourselves, isn't it? Because at what point do you just say enough is enough? You know, like how many thousands or hundreds of fig varieties do you have to try before you just give up and and just say, okay, I found some good ones. Like, can I just call it quits now? Yeah, you know? um, it feels so good to be at the point where I'm only adding a few each year. Now. <laughs> I'm calling far more than I'm keeping, you know, like I, I am almost at 1000 varieties grown and tasted, and I still have a couple of hundred more that I have yet to trial. And I'm a lot of those are my breeding project ones. So I've, I've actually taken 271 dash one and I bred it with uh, crows. I bred it with Hatif de Argentile with Fico Gentile and, uh, Unknown Pastelari now, and what's two seven one? Salib is that one of David? I think it's Salib. Oh, okay. UCR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two seven. Yeah, just their their um, persistent capper fig because I'm just having fun. I have no idea if I'm going to have anything good come out of it. I'm keeping sixteen plants from each cross, so you know I'll, okay. I'll have a decent amount, but it's just for fun. Uh, I just try and stay excited, but I, that's too many, man. It's too many. So, you know, is Salib, by the way, a re you just select Salib for a particular reason, or the, what was the thought process? I think Salib is two seven one dash one, and I selected mm -hmm. that because the guy who's in charge of the breeding project at UCR, he said that was his best one that they had the best crosses and he suggested that one for whatever reason i i don't remember why harvey sent that and shared that with me um so i i chose that one and just rolled with it best crosses i wonder what what fig lsu used um you know it, it's amazing because it's not just about the the female fig like whatever female fig you choose it's your your you know your genetics yeah. come from not just your mom but also your yep. dad so I have a feeling like choosing the right capra fig is going to be equally as important as choosing the, the right female yeah. fig. And it's like, how do I even begin to figure out which male fig that I want to yeah. use? I mean, you got to think about <laughs> first off, like, you know, you can't, you can't even eat them. So like, what am I going off? Am I going off of the shape? Am I going off of the hardiness? Like am I going off of when the fig ripens, how early it is? Like, it's it's it, it almost like is mind blowing and so i actually really think it'll never end because that's the inevitable road that i'm going to be going down is breeding figs and so once you have the ability i think to really recognize something spectacular it only makes sense that you should start breeding now of course there are so many figs that already exist that we don't even have and so breeding seems a bit foolish in that sense. But... So you say that, and I hear lots of people say that, but you try a caprified Feather River, mm -hmm. which is a California seedling, and there is no comparison. Yeah. So knowing that this yeah. random wild cross just came up there, and that knowing that that happened, it's like, well, what can I do? If I actually am concerned with the parentage, like if that fig, which is so next level above the majority of figs, the majority of high quality figs that I have, like, 
it just makes me like so excited to think of the possibilities of what could come next. If I never had a better fig than that, I wouldn't be surprised because it's at this point, it's like fig perfection, but who knows, you know, and that's a new, that's a new variety. That's better than, I mean, I've trialed almost a thousand varieties of figs, the best ones from all over the world. And they're topped by a caprified version of a wild seedling fig. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just think about it like that. So the odds are low that I'll find something better, but just that excitement, the possibility, the what if is so exciting for me that, you know, it fuels my passion. It almost makes planning the breeding project like foolish in a way. Cause you're like, that was just so random. You don't even know what the know. male is. You don't know what the female is. If I chose the best male fig that I could ever imagine, and I chose the best female fig, like let's say a Celeste or something for this climate, and I crossed the two together, I, would I ever end up with Feather River? I doubt yeah. it. You know? So. And the thing is, is it, you're it's right. so frustrating, is I'm only keeping 16 plants, and I could have had a thousand plants from each one fig cross right and i probably threw away the better ones so the odds are still really low but it's just fun it's just an excitement i'm not going to do it for very long if i have some really promising results uh, that's great but mm -hmm. it's just for fun more than anything this is what i can't wait to talk to david burke about um he's going to be someone that i'm going to interview as well on the, the youtube channel so I, i'm really curious to see his perspective on all this and um <laughs> I'll definitely get more into that with him. So, Eric, we're going to wrap this up, but I want to talk about the fig flavors. Okay, so we touched on the palate. It took us a long time to get from the palate to here. But um, I really want to know, because I think about this a lot, and if I had to describe a fig to another person, what would I even say? What does it even taste like? Also... I had, and still do this day, and I just updated it on my blog, um, a flavor profile sheet. And so I've broken out the most common defined profiles that I can think of, and there's about eight or nine of them. But those are figs that are uncaprified, you know? So if I then start going into caprified figs, well, then everything's going to change. I mean, it, it's not even, it's almost stupid, really, in a way, to think about the flavor profiles of figs because when you when you caprify them it's going to it's going to turn a fig that's in one flavor profile and totally put it in another and so it's almost uh, you know foolish but uh, of course it helps people and so it's there for a reason but you know it makes me think about where am i putting my time and so um what do you think about the flavors of figs and, and um, not necessarily the flavor profiles, but tell me as someone who's maybe even never had a fig, because to be honest, I've had a ton of figs, but there haven't been many that I've had that are caprified. So tell me about that. Well, the challenge of that is actually part of the reason why I'm so obsessed with them. I've grown fruits for most of my life. I'm passionate about them. I love the taste of them, the flavor of them. But until I found figs, I never grew anything that was as diverse as the flavor compounds and profiles that I was getting from figs. I have had figs that are more like a cherry than a freaking cherry. I've had some that are more like a strawberry than a strawberry, more like a raspberry mm -hmm. than a raspberry. I've had some that taste like you just took a mouthful of syrup. Some of them that are like you've got a bunch of sugar in your mouth and, and honey. Like there's so many different flavors that you can find from this one classification of ficus carica. It is just mind blowing to me that they're even the same fruit. Now, when we're talking about chocolate, yeah, we have subtle. And I say subtle because it's usually fairly subtle. Subtle notes of lemon, subtle notes of strawberry, subtle notes of pine, subtle notes of oak. But with figs, it's crazy. It's crazy. If you close your eyes and you had a perfectly ripe unknown pastillary and you gave it to somebody, they would think that you gave them a soft cherry, right? So how do you describe this to somebody else? I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, which one am I describing? But that's what makes them so fun, especially the caprified version. There is no other fruit out there, period, 
that can give you a cherry or a raspberry or a bowl of sugar or a strawberry. I mean, it's just incredible that they can get. And then you have some of these like a caprified planera that tastes like tropical fruit punch. You know, some of them are so incredibly complex that there's just so much going on. There's an upfront flavor, a middle flavor. There's a lingering flavor that that I think is one of the things that really, really gets people addicted and hooked to it is because it's a flavor that you have not experienced and you probably won't experience unless it's been through a perfectly ripened fig. Yeah, there's a lot of, I want to say about all that. I actually gave my brother a number of fruits over the years and uh, different people over the years, obviously. But sometimes people look at me when I give them a fig for the first time and they're like, they're almost so shocked <laughs> like they, that they think like that it's not even real. And then also some, like my brother, I gave him a goji berry one time. Uh, and there's two species of goji berry, but one of them is terrible. It's so bad that you spit out of your mouth bad. He thought I poisoned him. <laughs> so like, I just, I just think, you know, it's, it's true. Like explaining this stuff to people is so difficult. Um, in terms of texture too, I don't think people really put enough emphasis on texture yeah. and I want to get into that, but I do forget before I forget Smith is one that to me always has a lingering flavor. And so it's so lingering that I've had figs that actually of a similar flavor profile, eating them after Smith, it tastes like Smith because it's still in my mouth that I, I didn't even realize that. Um, I remember I, when I first started out, I was like, wait a second, that fig just tasted just like the one before it. And so <laughs> Uh, years later, I'm like watching this video of me review these figs and I'm like, wait a second. Um, that's not right, but I can't have Smith first. I got to do that one last. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I just think there's certain figs that just ruin it somehow. You get to cleanse your palate. Yeah. Um, so, and you know what else also, before we get into texture, David, when I ate his figs, I, I totally experienced everything you just said. Like, I believe the tropical fruit punch. I believe all of that crap. You know, when I eat the figs here that aren't caprified it's and they're not in the perfect climate they're not grown with the perfect soil moisture it just doesn't it doesn't come out like that compared every time. to caprified some ex they're boring i don't know how other ways to boring. describe it if you have never had caprified figs you're probably in love and you think that they're fantastic but if you have had caprified figs they're boring so there are there are that you said that are are up there and they're good but again i would totally agree with you they are boring there's just something missing. And so when they are caprified, that f weird flavor profile, and I was eating David's figs, and I had to do the video over. You know, you could attest in this, how many times did we do something over, right? I've pretty much been doing this off the cuff the entire yeah. time. And so for me to do it over, I was just so dumbfounded <laughs> about what I was even eating. Like I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the figs, and I'm looking at them and I'm saying, okay, this is gonna taste like this. Because I know, I know what they taste like by looking at them sometimes. And so it was a total 180. It didn't taste anything like that. And then the flavor of it, I was like, wait a second. I know what this is, but I've never tasted this in a fig before. So I was like, I, have I even eaten figs before? Like I was literally contemplating in my mind. I'm like, I've never done a fig tasting before. Like yeah. <laughs> it was just so, it was so strange. Um, so I guess that leads us though into texture because I think it's the most underrated part of anything i mean food just in general is texture 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 and so you mentioned planera has a really really thick and dense texture i think you yeah said, or was it feather river both of them um so what do you because i always recommend cold adams the people who don't have the wasp they want to know about the texture you know black madeira is the one you go for the for the flavor and then cold adams the one for the texture yeah so what are you, what are you going to just give us some lessons on? Time. Yeah, I, I would say that as far as uncaprified versions go, the cold Adam types are definitely very thick. They're not necessarily what I would describe as that extremely dense. Um, Cause that's just a different, a different, it's like almost median dense. Some of these figs, whereas the cold Adams, they're just like very thick and, kind of pasty thick good delicious like I, I love cold adams but it's not quite the same 
denseness as I'm describing with some of these others. I like to describe them as like a, a pancake batter. Yeah. Like they're almost like a pastry. Yeah. So I can see that. And there are definitely some that are even more so. They're softer and they coat your mouth just like you just put some pancake batter in your mouth. So, yeah, that's definitely some of the thicker types are like that. But then you have the ones that are just so full of syrup and, and honey, but still like a nice texture like the black Madeiras. And then you have something like Zafiro which is very light, super thin skin. The whole texture of that is much lighter and it's almost like fluffy compared to a Col de Dom type. It's not nearly as substantial, but it's a, an exceptional flavor as well. Um, the texture is so fun. Like there are some varieties, caprified or not, that have this amazing seed crunch that for me, I get bored if I was just to have something like that was the same texture. You know, that's why chocolate with nuts is so much more appealing and easier to eat a whole bar of than just a bar of chocolate because you have something to break up the monotony of just this smooth texture, which can be awesome at times, but sometimes you want more. So there are figs that have really small seeds that are just this little crunch. And then you have some that it's like, it's like you're just so crunchy and it's so loud in your mouth and it's so satisfying. I, I, I don't really know how to describe that, but I definitely have a lot of people who comment on the the enjoyment they get from the texture of that seed crunch that they have, which is more pronounced when they are caprified. It is more noticeable because now, instead of just a little seed, they actually take on like a nutty quality to them whenever they've been caprified, and they're full of germ instead of just the little shell. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. I uh, I didn't know how that worked. I thought for some reason the seeds increased in number, but it's just the outside shell of the uh, the seed. That's that's really yeah, nice. Yeah, some of them the the tiny seed will get larger, but it's it's not that the number of seeds increases. It's the same amount. Some of them get larger, but I have lots of varieties that have really big seeds. But if you crack them open, they're empty. Whereas the caprified version, they have the germ inside of it so that it, it is a, a thicker, more fun texture that is, I describe it as a, a nutty taste. So that's another layer of flavor that you get from caprified figs. That's amazing because I haven't really tasted any nuttiness uh, for the most part in uh, any of my uncaprified figs. Maybe there is one that I'm just not thinking of. Um you know, on the terms of texture, Barb alone is a new fig to me. I've had it for a number of years, but um, it has a texture. If, if a fig was a cloud, that would be the fig. It, it just has a the lightest, airy texture. It's so strange. And so I would highly recommend that. I wonder what it's like when it's caprified. Um, I think a lot more people ought to grow it because it's it's not just your simple honey fig. There's a little bit of more complexity in there, like Zafiro. And so it also has a great texture. And so for me, that is like hands down one of the better figs I got. Uh, Tiger, LSU Tiger. And because you didn't really touch on the skin, which I'm, I'm sure you will after I'm done here, but LSU Tiger has got this skin that's so chewy and and sweet and almost like a total it's a it's not a uniform uh feeling in your mouth obviously you know a lot some figs have that uniform texture whereas others they contrast so well especially with tiger in particular with that really difference of the chewier thicker yeah. skin that's not even too thick or hard it's more of like a it's still almost in your way can melt in your mouth like the pulp, but it's such a different contrast there. So. Yeah, for sure. Golden Rainbow is another one of those that like some people just don't like the skin. You know, they're envisioning that they're all going to be that hard leathery skin. But sometimes the skin really adds a unique layer of texture, but also flavor. Golden Rainbow, the sweetest part of that is the skin for me. So if you're just eating the pulp of that, fig then you're missing out on half of the experience and that's definitely not the only one yeah lsu tiger is one of those for sure i get that same thing from uh del sin Fami gran i don't oh, know really? how you say that but I, I have that same experience with that one and there are definitely a few that my wife doesn't like the thick skin but 
if it, if I know that the skin adds a layer of, of depth and complexity to it in a positive way, I always make sure to tell my wife, I'm like, you're going to want to eat the skin on this one. <laughs> yeah. So what would be your go-to fig? If you, if you had to eat one fig, it would be Feather River, right? <clears throat> Caprified, yes. If you had to eat 10 figs, what would you do? You're killing me here. I get asked this. <laughs> well, I don't want to say – I don't want you to name your 10 favorite figs. I want you to think about in a way – because how many Feather Rivers can you eat back-to-back, -back, right? Oh, yeah. They're – it's – yeah, for sure. Because it's so complex, you need something to break up the the intensity of that, you know. So, like, I, I have – these are just some random ones thrown out there. Madeira Island Black is one that I'm always ecstatic about. Zafiro is one. Smith is another. You just can't have too much. Golden Rainbow, while definitely on its own not one of my favorite figs, it's awesome. It's pleasant. It's enjoyable. So I like that it's just a lighter, juicier. It's almost like you're eating a pear instead of a fig, you know? So I like the variety. Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross is another one that, like, nonstop. When you want a little flavor bomb, caprified or not, Green Meat Sharinska, those are awesome. They're tiny, but they're just so packed full of that complex flavor. The first ones that I had this year, I thought that I had caprified figs again because they had more of that tartness that I only get from caprified. And they weren't. They weren't caprified. Yeah. So Green Meat Sharinska is one. Um Bordeso Negra Ramada, I love the texture. It's it's like a not as dense Black Madeira type fig. Uh, Del Sin Palmi Gran is fantastic. Caprified version is out of this world, but the uncaprified version is also really good. It's just it goes from being this sugar bomb to an extremely complex, very intense flavor when they're caprified, but. That's definitely definitely one of my favorites. Uh, Let me ask you this: so Green Micharinska, okay, I I really like that fig too. I, I actually this year or last year at the end of the year I put it in my top twenty. I don't know where exactly I would place it, but it's very good. It performs well. It's exceptional. Um, my only question with it though is. How different really is it from these other age very. ranks? And so I, very, very okay, very different. Because I had originally thought it, the original thought was that it was similar to the Adriatics and that it was classified as an early Adriatic. And then I ripened some and I thought this doesn't really taste like to me like an Adriatic no. fig. And so, but I was like, maybe I'm wrong. Like, because every one of them on the on that tree of the last couple of years, I've had them been a, a little bit different than each other it's like um you know a lot of people say that every fig on this on the tree is different um and so that's true to an extent but but this one it seemed to me a little bit more than than others in that situation um but that's good to know because i was wondering that myself now you did mention the caprification uh because we didn't touch on this and i forgot forgot about it but the caprification increases the acidity oh yeah for sure and so i actually don't even like too much acidity in my figs i think it's a little bit strange um i do like a berry flavor uh but when they taste a bit like a cherry or a raspberry i'm a little bit put off um i don't know what that is maybe it's just a time thing and i have to get used to it um but for some reason i i just don't prefer that as often that balance and i i just have a sweet tooth but um yeah, so that, everybody has their different flavor profiles i have a, a guy from the forum fig gazer is his username he's a local here uh we try figs together all the time he loves the sweet figs those are his absolute favorite ones he doesn't like the really complex tart flavored unknown pastelary he doesn't like like at all right and it's one of my favorite figs so that is just a matter of of your personal preferences but to speak a little bit more to that, it doesn't necessarily just make them more acidic. It also sometimes makes them more sweet. So now instead of this cloyingly sweet fig, sometimes you have a cloyingly sweet fig that has added nuanced, 
complexity of berry and this acidity to cut it and make it so that instead of eating three, you could now eat 10. Mm. So it really helps to balance the flavor profile of figs instead of just making them more, more one tiered in flavor. There's a lot more complexity going on with them. So they're usually, or many times there is increased sweetness to offset the acidity, but you get to experience both of those in the same bite, which for me is a lot more fun. I'm a big foodie. This is, has happened over the last several years as I'm in. But you're a big foodie. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't catch that already, right? I, <laughs> I now am looking for adventures. I'm looking for an experience, something new. And that's one of the things I really feel caprification does is it takes a great fig and turns it into an experience and a journey. So you're no longer just this mm. one, one layer of flavor. There's multiple layers of flavor going on with the same fig. So you mentioned over pollen, uh, pollination. And so you mentioned the wasps. There's too many wasps that go in the same fig. Now, what about if you hand pollinate? You can do the same thing, correct? Yeah, you can. The The standard thing that most people that I have seen have tried is like five grams of pollen to like 100 grams or maybe it's 0.5 grams. I don't know. Just look it up online. There is something. And if you follow that protocol, it doesn't look like you're really over caprifying the figs. If you try to do it with the little cloth thing and poke it in there, then that's not nearly as scientific. So a lot of times people who have tried that method have over caprified their figs and caused a lot of splitting. But if you do the one that is in a solution of, of sugar water um, at the rate that they state, I can't remember if it's 0.5 grams or five grams. It must be 0.5 because five seems like an awful lot per hundred grams or hundred milliliters of water. Then you just poke a hole in the fig and then you let a little bit of water. When a drop of water comes out the eye, then it's done and you just leave it at that. And most people have had very good results with that in the studies, the scientific studies that are done and those in recent years who have been sharing their experiences online. Oh, oh, one thing for sure, in certain areas, of California, and I believe here in Santa Barbara, some of our capra figs, I think they have some sort of mold. So you end up getting a lot of figs that have endosepsis. And so unless you cut that capra fig open and spray to kill this mold off, that goes in your fig. And I, I usually have 10 to 15% of my figs that would spoil whenever they were caprified from the wasp. So hand pollinating, you won't have to worry about that. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, so then if you had a a capra fig, is it possible that a capra fig would not have pollen? If it's a male tree, it's got to have pollen, right? I think. I, I think so. Um, I don't know for sure. I know the ones that I grow <laughs> all have it, and all of the ones that I found in the wild, if it is the profici crop, they have all had yeah. pollen. Some of them have significantly more than others, but I've mm -hmm. never found one that didn't have any pollen so far. And so when does that pollen really form in the fig? It's only really at the end. Yeah, it's right right towards the end whenever it's ripening. Um, the best thing is to wait until it gets soft, almost like a regular fig, and then mm -hmm. pick it off, cut it open, and stick it in the fridge for 24 hours so that it starts to dry up a little, that releases the pollen more readily so that you can shake it out instead of it being wet and it, it's a little harder to get. So uh, definitely let it dry a little bit before you try and shake out that pollen. That's a really nice lesson. So one thing before I let you go here, Eric, uh, I I do have a capra fig, a couple capra figs uh, in my greenhouse. And so I let the capra figs, the profici ripen, um, all the way until they fell off the tree. And so they were soft and they changed color a bit and looked like to me they were ripe. Uh, taking the profici off the tree and opening them all up one by one, there was probably 40 of them. None of them had pollen. And so I'm really confused because this was really, I was hoping this year to do some hand pollinating and I wasn't able to because of that. And so maybe I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's the variety, maybe 
because of the setup in my greenhouse and how it's quite shaded and you know just there's a lot of trees in such a small space it's really not a lot of light maybe the figs fell off prematurely and instead of getting to that final ripening stage they they actually just fell off um, is it a confirmed persistent type because i i, I I am confused about capper figs. Don't get me wrong. And there seems to be a lot of confusion mm -hmm. about them. But I had believed yeah. that you had to have a persistent capper fig in order for that profici to ripen with pollen. It has to be persistent. I, I okay. could be wrong about that. But I, that might be what happened, maybe. I'm not sure. So it makes sense that it would have to be persistent. Because if it's not persistent, which... They only use persistent capper figs in breeding because the persistent ones have the pollen. So, yeah, I guess that makes sense that not all capper figs would be persistent, and they're not all persistent, and not all capper figs will produce that pollen, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah. So, all right, so that's at least a theory for now. We'll see how that one works yeah. out. But... Um, yeah, Eric, this has been so amazing. I wish uh, we could talk for more. I'm sure that there's other topics of, uh, you know, in-depth things that people kind of go back and forth about and, um, you know, people have one opinion on and another opinion on. And so um, there's always a lot of nuance and maybe it's not ever, you know, usually one side or the other. Um, but it's interesting, as we've just learned in this video, to see the perspective of somebody else, how that's dramatically change their thoughts and their opinions on rowing figs and um yeah so i really i thank you so much for joining me here uh, i'm sure everybody loved this episode um if there's anything you want to plug i don't know if you have something in particular uh maybe fig trees or your chocolate business or something uh feel free if there's something you want to say i don't even know if you have something to plug you want to give some life lesson or something uh <laughs> Be my guest. No, I, I'm fine. I don't really have any anything to plug or, or to say. Just just had fun being here. Thanks for the opportunity. I love talking figs, sharing figs, and hopefully there will be some people who learn some things and get a little bit of our passion, and we can just keep having fun growing figs together. Absolutely, man. So... Anyway, guys, this was Ross, and this was Eric Durchie. I really thank you guys for watching this one. Please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Check out our blog, figboss.com, and um, caprify some figs, man. Take care, guys.